Right, well, welcome everyone again to this month's uh, London Web Performance Group Meetup. Um, kind of again, the usual thing of show of hands of people that have never come before, because it's always nice to know that we're getting new members. That's really great. So please go out, spread the word, especially if you enjoy the talk. If you don't enjoy the talk, still spread the word. Yeah, because uh, um, groups, uh, it's always great to have uh, new members coming along. Um, right, my name is Perry Dybul. I've been running the group for ages. For those of you who don't know me, I gave the first talk at this group back in about January 2011, I think. So it's been a long, hard, torturous road for those five and a five and a bit years. But anyway, um, so just very quick logistics. Um, toilets are out through the corridor, straight across on the right-hand side. Um, last month, we had some people going all over the building because there was a lot of people here last month and people are trying to find toilets on other floors. Please don't do that, right? Um, if security catch you somewhere else, um, you may get asked to leave. So uh, please stay on this floor and just uh, take your turn, as it were. Um, if there is, you'll see that they've actually put a barrier, kind of one of those tape barriers across the stairwell to try and discourage you from, from doing that. So if there is a fire, clearly undo the barrier and then get out, all right? Um, but yeah, again, don't, don't, don't use the lifts. Um, so that's it on health and safety. Um, in terms of what we've got coming up in the next couple of months, um, on September the 6th, again, uh, choose first Tuesday of the month, got uh, Cornell Lis Lisinski, um, sort of, uh, and he's going to be talking about snake oil in image compression. Um, if any of you have sort of like heard Cornell before, you know that like image compression is his absolute passion. And um, and he's going to give you the talk. What he's, I think it's about. I think it's a good eighteen months, two years since he talked at the group. So probably a lot has changed in in his world in that time. So he's going to give us a fantastic update on that. And in October, um, so we're going to. I forget the date, but again, first Tuesday of the month. I'm going to have Adam Anishi, and he's going to talk about the actual development of the. London Web Performance Group website um, and he's talking about it at Velocity so I'm a little bit nervous about that because I'm going to end up with like 800 people going on the site <laughs> um, to have a look and stuff like that so it'd be great from promotion point of view but obviously we're going to make sure that uh, we've got everything fully tuned up in advance of that um, so that again should be a great talk in terms of just general audience and stuff and we like to encourage new speakers um, I am now looking for new speakers for the group from um, November onwards um, so if you've either got a talk that you'd like to give or you know someone that you would like to hear from particularly let me know and um, and hopefully we can we can kind of get that scheduled in the future Right, but for now, I'm going to be handing over to Jonathan Fielding, and he's going to give his talk on negotiating for performance. Um, this is something that is close to my heart because I'm going through it myself right now at Ticketmaster. We're just, like doing a um, big project there that's in this area and trying to like make sure that the that the business kind of buys into um, buys into performance and actually get them to uh, participate in in the whole uh, whole ship whole performance shebang so anyway so i'll stop now I'll hand over to jonathan at the end of the talk get a beer pizza's at half past eight everyone's a winner right, right. now this was seamless when we tried this <laughs> earlier so now it's going to take 20 minutes to get it to work this time so. Look at that, fantastic. Andrew, if you can just unmute Jonathan. All done. Hello. We're good to go. So, um, hello. It's, it's awesome being here tonight. Um, I've been to this meetup quite a few times. Um, so, I, and obviously, it's, it's a really good meetup to be, to be speaking at. Um, so, a bit about me. So, I'm a technical architect at Beamly. At Beamly. Uh, yes, we're hiring for JavaScript engineers at the moment. Got to put that plug in there somewhere. Um, I've written a book on responsive design, uh, called, called Responsive Design, 
And I've, I've contributed to lots of open source projects, including the Financial Times Polyfill Service, which if you're not using, I recommend you use. Um, and of course, um, the most important thing event, event is pizza, right? So I'm here just to warm you up prior to the pizza and make you get hungry. So many talks on performance focus on implementation. They look at the steps we, we take to make a site performance and focusing on the techniques we use instead of the process we take. So typically, we're spending, spending our time at the latter end of our projects looking at performance. We're not looking at it at the beginning. So today, what we're going to do is, is focus on how we can make performance the center of our process and really champion performance within our, our, our businesses we work in. Looking at how we can raise awareness within, about performance within our teams through taking the, them through the benefits that it brings to both the users and the business. We will identify how, how we can use performance as a competitive advantage. And we will look at this from, from the perspective of a new site. But then we're going to move on to how we can retrospectively uh, the add a, a performance budget to an existing site. Ultimately, the, the aim of, of this talk is to, is to help you understand the language you should use to, with, with, with other stakeholders to communicate with about performance. So situations you may have found yourself in. So the client wants to use a background GIF for every block on the home page, and they're five megabytes each. The designer used six, six fonts again, and it's already been approved by the client. Doug's getting frustrated there. The analytics team wants to track how users interact with your site, and the tracking script is larger than the rest of my page. That's actually happened to me. It's really frustrating. So the thing is, Clients don't ask for sites that take forever to load. They ask for a site that enables them to achieve specific goals. So the requests that, you should, that you're receiving from clients are, to achieve those, are, are actually to achieve those goals, and they're based on their experience from maybe working on other websites, um, and they're not wanting to make your site slow. Designers don't design sites to be slow. They design sites that are, are, are focused on brand and eye-catching because they want their, use, their, their, their work to be a pleasure for users to use. It, 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 it's important to them that they, their users enjoy using the site. Analytics teams want you to, want, don't want to have an impact on your site at all. They actually want to be completely transparent to your users. They, they just want to track user behavior. Uh, and that data, data they gather can actually help developers deciding what they want to improve in the future. So think, so say Google Analytics, for example, it can, you can use it to track performance metrics. So that can be really valuable to where we need to improve in the real world. Unfortunately, the requirements of our stakeholders are often odds with performance. So stakeholders' typical aims are to achieve KPIs, um, have an appealing design that's really for users and eye-catching, uh, provide a feature experience, um, track their user behavior so they can iterate and improve in the future. And obviously, we need to be on brand. So that's where those six fonts might come in, because you might have different weights of, of, of font that they use in their brand in their offline messaging. So whilst we're trying to reach those things, we, we also want to ensure that our site is performance and functional and lightweight. So that's why building a site starts to become like a balancing act. We're like balancing an elephant on top of a beach ball, where we need to engage, where we, 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 we're trying to engage with stakeholders to balance our site requirements. So we need to look at how we can make those stakeholders more aware of performance, because that's the only way we're going to succeed in, 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 in balancing the act. So when I build a website, I, I obsess over performance. I will literally rip out a JavaScript library from a project and replace it with another one to save 10K. I will trawl NPM to find something smaller. Um, I, I, I will, spend, I, I will spend, spend, spend time with my build tools to, to, build some, to, to, to make it so my CSS is smaller, so I might switch out which CSS minifier I'm using. So I, I, and I do this because I understand the impact of performance, both as a developer who has built a wide variety of websites and as a user who, who, who spent last weekend struggling to get one bar of signal at a campsite, where I actually managed to get better signal from France than I did from the UK, which is crazy. Um, and, but being, being aware of why performance matters can help your stakeholders get on board. And, 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 and to do that, they need to understand what performance is. So there, there are three key types of performance they need to make your stakeholders aware of. So this render time performance. So this is the time it takes from your page to going from that white screen to being um, start to render. Um, then we have page load performance. So this is like the, the time it takes for everything to be downloaded and CSS assets to be load, downloaded and stuff. Then we have perceived performance. So this is the perception the user of the gets of, the, of your site. Uh, perceived performance sits somewhere between the middle of those two. It refers to how fast a user thinks your website is, 
not necessarily how you, your fast your technical stats say it is. So we're going to look at a video of the Guardian site. Um, so it's on a slow 3G connection, and at four seconds, um, the content starts to load. At seven seconds, the images are starting to load. So that's when, um, from the user's point of view, it starts to be um, something you can interact with and think. And, and, and as you can see, the home icon just arrived. So, that, so I've got the perception that I can interact with this, go to a new article and stuff. But it's actually still loading. I mean, it, it actually take, takes till 32, to, to, uh, 32 seconds for the um, ads to start loading. Yeah, you for adverts. So uh, <laughs> everyone obviously waits for the adverts, right? Uh, so of, of these three, the three, the most important is perceived performance. But, but, but that's great, because actually, that's the easiest one to, to explain to your stakeholders. So to, to, to a designer, the perceived performance has an impact on the user experience of the site. It's the first impression the user gets when they visit your site. So even the site, its site design is visually amazing, a site that loads slow has already give, given a bad impression. And to, to clients or your product managers, maybe if you work in a product business, um, performance can affect what they're trying to achieve. So the majority of client, clients, product managers, are, are, are aiming to receive, reach a specific, specific KPIs. There might, these might be a number of new signups, costs of acquiring or retaining customers, um, how, how they might want a high visitor return rate or, or, or a low visitor bounce rate, a, a high level of engagement, and also, they want to rank well in search engines. So there's a lot they, 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 they're actually trying to achieve with the website. Performance, however, has an impact of, on, on the KPIs of our site. Uh, um, this is reflected in studies carried out by some big brands. So Amazon found a 100 millisecond delay in loading a page cost them 1% in sales. Uh, I want to put that in perspective for you. So in 2014, Amazon revenue totaled $89 billion. So 1% of, of their revenue would be $900 million. So that's a, that's a, that's a, big, a big amount of money that they, um, that they would lose if they, they were, their site was slower. Google found an extra 500 milliseconds delay in loading search results decreased traffic by, traffic by 20%. So again, that's 20% less adverts they can show you. The train line reduced latency by 0.3 seconds, and the customer spent an extra 8 million pounds a year. And Walmart saw for every one second decrease in, in page load, that 2% increase in conversions. So these are all really good case studies that you can show, show to your stakeholders to explain to them the importance of performance. Um, if, you want, if, if you want to keep getting more up-to-date um, examples, you can use uh, wpostats.com. So this is a great site for keeping up to date with the latest performance studies, which is great, good for increasing awareness within your business. The site performance has an impact on search ranking as well. So uh, Google, Bing, and other search engines are all using its path to their ranking algorithms. So um, to be able to appear high in their search results, you'll, you'll, you'll want to um, actually optimize performance for that. With the benefit it brings to business, performance is clearly a competitive advantage. We therefore want to ensure our site loads faster than our clients' competitors. To enable to do this, we need to test our competitor sites, as this will give us a target to what we want to achieve. So we're going to take Beam Leads, for example, because that's where I work. Um, uh, so the, the, the closest thing I can think of to our site is BuzzFeed, because we write a lot of gossipy content um, on, our, on our new site. And because of the audience here, we probably want to throw in the Financial Times and Guardian into the mix, just to mix it up a bit. Um, so I did obsess about the performance of the Beamly site when I built it. Um, so that's probably reflecting these results. So to run our test, we can use WebPage Test. It's got this great feature that enables you to do a visual comparison of different sites. So I've put in Beamly, uh, BuzzFeed, uh, Guardian, and the Financial Times. I apparently can't spell Guardian correctly, as you'll see in one of the future slides. Um, it was on a video, so I couldn't easily change it either. So we then sit, 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 uh, we, we need to sit patiently while we test the test run. Um, I wish that the loading screens of web page tests had awesome gifts like that. Um, finally, once it's run, you'll see a film strip view, which shows the site's loading. In this case, in half-second intervals. I mean, you can specify in more intervals, but it didn't, didn't look very good on the slide. Um, then then, then if, we, if we look through this thing, we can see uh, with Beamly, followed by Guardian, uh, BuzzFeed, then uh, Financial Times in terms of start render. So Financial final Times started to render at four seconds. Um, we can also export the comparison from web page test as video. This is really good at showing our clients because you can, you can show them the, the comparisons against your, um, 
against your, um, your competitors. So we look at that again in the video. We've got the Beamly, a Guardian, we'll see you at the times. So, so when running these benchmarks against our competitors, we want to do it for different types of pages. So on a new site, we would benchmark the article pages alongside our home page, our category pages. The reason for this is that it's all well and good getting our home page to load very fast. But if an article takes forever to load, and that's the content users try and get to, then, then you, your battery is lost. Having seen how our competitors perform, we should always aim to be faster. So a very good uh, quote from Tim Cadillac was, from his blog was this. For example, say a competitor's site loads in five seconds, 20% of five seconds is one second. So to be perceived faster than them, you need to have your page take no longer than four seconds. So that's because five seconds load time is 20% difference. So he's suggesting there's a 20% minimum difference you need to achieve. Yeah, I'll repeat that again. Um, so we, we, shouldn't tr we, sh we shouldn't try to ach just achieve this. So we should always try to push ourselves as far as we can to build the fastest sites possible. Because 80% of a 10 second load time is still eight seconds, and that's still a slow website. It's like being a slug. So, so in his book, Usability Engineering, Jacob Nielsen identified response time limits. Um, so what he said was, um, an interaction that takes 0.1 seconds feels instantaneous. Um, this is something that, um, that, that, that yeah, you, you can't tell the difference. Then, you, then when you get to one second, it's, um, it, feels, it feels seamless, like a, a really seamless uh, interaction. But then by, by the time you reach 10 seconds, you're starting to lose your attention. Uh, you keep, keep you to, but then by you've got 10 seconds, you've got a sad dog picture because we, we, the user is going to abandon your site. Uh, so this reinforces the need to ensure our site is performance. You can, you, you, you can you, use building a new site, actually, as a way to establish awareness. So it's, it's worth not, uh, noting this. So when, when you're looking, uh, looking to build a new site, you, um, you should look at the client's existing site and, and use this to, to create a usability assessment. This enables you to identify strengths and weaknesses of the current user experience. Um, this should also include looking at how the existing site performs when it comes to performance, as this enables you to benchmark the, against the old site when your new site is built. This data can then be used to link an increase in performance to an increase of KPIs, which in turn can help justify maintaining performance and not just add things later that might later jeopardize it. So, so we're going to look now at um, ensuring how we plan uh, performance. Having ensured everyone is aware of why we want to care about performance, we need to plan this in our process. Because as, as a lot of you know, businesses rely on processes and how they do things. So it's not uncommon for a developer for, to see a design when they're asked to build it. Um, I bet many of you, you had this experience. Uh, I've had that way too many times. Um, fortunately, I don't get it anymore. Uh, that's because I complained a lot. So at, the, at this point, it's too late to see, see planning. Uh, how to make the site performance because potentially the client, the client has already seen approved that design, so they've already, they've already added, added those things that make sites more performance. So you, you've got they, they, so your designer might love the carousels, the six fonts, the crazy animated background GIF. I like the video picture. <laughs> is, is it video because it's you need animation, right? Um, so they, 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 this is happening every day across our industry. So I'm often speaking to people who, who have this as, as a daily occurrence, and it's not how it should be. The, because the rules, and the result is our web pages are getting bigger and bigger. The average page weight as of April was bigger than downloading Doom. And I'll be honest, I'd rather download Doom than look at a lot of websites, right? So, and this isn't down to the lack of knowledge in Teams. It's, in, it's down to the way that knowledge is utilized within Teams. It's, and it's down to the problem in the processes we get, we're going through to build our sites. This is, this is why you need to ensure that uh, project goals is for the site to be performance. We already have made our stakeholders aware of the impact of performance, so it needs, now we need to make it the heart of our process and make, make it the heart of everything we do. So, so um, this, this might be a typical development flow, so you have to do some business, deve business development around um, with, with the clients, then you might do some research, some UX research, get some user testers in, uh, talk about current experiences and stuff. Then you might design something, um, and then, it, then, then a developer then gets involved, and he then is asked to build it. So it's normally between design and development, and the, design, the, the, the uh, client has gone away and, and been like, yeah, this is an amazing design. I want this to be built now. Um, but instead, you should be thinking at the start of the project. So even before you've engaged with your clients, uh, have, it, have it in your, your account manager's minds that they need to be talking about performance with them. 
Um, you might even have like standard ways of talking to them about performance that, um, that, that, that you, might, you might do. So you might even teach your account managers to use web page tests to generate those visual comparisons of their existing site versus the competitors. Um, so when working with your client, you should, yeah, you should include it in your statement of work. Um, it, should be, it, should, it, it should be written, in, written down that you are going to make that website performance. Then as you carry out your research, look at connection speeds that you, their users have. Because um, it's all well and good at build, building a website for users in London uh, and, and, and planning for everything for in London if they're, if they're down on Folkestone behind a cliff that blocks signal. Um, <laughs> that would be the weekend. Um, so, and, and, and actually, if your site's international, um, this will, the, the number of the connection speeds your users will have will, 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 could, could uh, vary greatly. So if, if you're potentially targeting people in uh, remote areas of Africa, you might, they might fi find that the connection speeds are terrible. Um, so then you've, you've got to the design stage, uh, and just during the design and build, you should regularly get your team together to review work. So I, I don't know about you guys, but I, uh, at Beamly we use an agile, agile development methodology. And this can be, so this means we can, um, and this means we actually talk about, um, about our work and review work as part of every sprint. So that's, I mean, that, that, that enables us to have a time we set aside. So and, and then you should, you should aim to get your designs into the build as soon as possible. So you've got those designs, they're, they're beautiful, um, but sometimes you might find a problem in, your, in, in, in the design when it comes to performance that you didn't anticipate. So if you get it into build quickly, um, you, can hope, you can hopefully manage your client's expectations sooner. So this is the negotiating bit, uh, encouraging communication. So communication in your teams is really important. So having broad performance at the beginning of our process, we need to have a common way to talk about it. The first step we can take before we even start to build up a site is to create a performance budget. This is where the art of negotiation is going to start to appear. So a performance budget is a goal that guides uh, design and development. It gives us a tangible way to talk about performance. Um, so I'm quoting Tim Cadillac again. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> the, uh, the purpose of a performance budget is to make sure you focus on performance throughout the project. The reason you do the, go through the trouble in the first place, though, is because you want to build a site that feels fast for your visitors. So you, you go into this process because you care about your visitors. In order to determine what your project budget should be, you, you, need, you need to determine what you're going to measure. So in his, in his, in his post, Tim Cadillac uh, identified four such measures, metrics. So the first of which was milestone timing. So this is the time-based metrics such as load time, DOM loaded, content loaded, and time to render. <laughs> then we have things like speed, speed index. So this speed metric you measure by web page test, and it gives a good indication of page performance. So you might have a performance budget that says, I will get this certain score. Um, then we have quantity-based metrics. So this might be the total number of requests, overall page weight, uh, total image weight, um, total CSS weight. So there's anything that can be measured quantitatively. And then we have rule-based metrics. So I don't tend to like these because these, 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 these are things like page speed score and why slow score. But really, I, prefer, I, I see them more as checklists rather than something that I'd put into my performance budget. But it's something some, some people do. Um, so to put together our, our budget, we need a combination of these metrics. And it's up to your team to determine which metrics make, make sense to you. So Andy Davies, who sat here lovely at the front, uh, uh, said this on Twitter. So to me, a perfect budget needs to be an event that matters to the visitor with a set time under defined network conditions. So to identify the metric, we, need, we therefore need to identify the event that matters to our users on our site. And this will vary from site to site. For Twitter, this might be the time until the navigation is visible, because obviously they, they want people to be able to get to the page they want as quick as possible. So let's have a look. So as this video demonstrates, the navigation loads quickly, followed by a post box, so I can tweet reasonably quickly. So for Facebook, this might be the time until the user is able to make a post. So if you look at the, the Facebook website, uh, top bar loads quickly, but the next thing that loads is actually the post box. So very quickly, I can create, start creating content on Facebook. And obviously, that's what Facebook wants me to do. They, they want me to start creating content that they can use to make lots of money, because Facebook sells you. True story. Uh, and the Financial Times might want to lay out the page ready for content to load into as it loads. So this is the Financial Times. Um, so first, the page loads like this, um, it's like a frame, um, and then uh, the content loads into your imagery and stuff, so that's another load, which is great, because then the, the user isn't, get, isn't getting an experience that jumps around and stuff. 
So we're going to look at an example. So that for our site, an event that matters, matters could be they're able to start interacting with the page. Therefore, we use this as an event we're targeting, um, for example, performance budget. Therefore, the time it takes until it to, to get to this point should be our performance budget. Uh, so we might decide that we want the page to be interacted within five seconds on a slow 3G connection. So this is actually what, what we decided on the, um, on the Beamly site when we were building it. Um, and in order to calculate our, our budget, we needed to find slow 3G. So I actually use web page tests as all, as all my um, list of um, what to call my connection speeds. Uh, it, it, it's, a, it's, it's, it's quite um, a, 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 good, a, good, a good source for um, that sort of information. And it defines this as, as slow 3G is 96 kilobytes per second. So as we want our site to load in, in five seconds, um, that's 96 kilobytes by times five seconds equals 480 kilobytes. We can then split 480 kilobytes across our assets. Um, so we have, um, so what I've done is I've put 30 kilobytes for HTML. This enables me to have a reasonably long article. Uh, 40 kilobytes for our CSS, which allows us to provide rich visual layouts, and 50, uh, 50 kilobytes of JavaScript. Uh, leaving 360 kilobytes for imagery because obviously articles are very image heavy. If we then decide we want to add web points to our, our, our website, we just adjust our budget. We, we sit with our designer and discuss with them how, how this has an impact on our site. So here what I've done is I've reduced our images by 60K, and I'm actually giving that to the fonts because my, my fonts was, was going to be 60K. Um, the thing is, you, you, you're not, you're not, you're not, you're not um, limited to only having one budget. Um, you, might, you, you might want to have different performance budgets for different conditions. A good example would be different size devices, which might have different performance budgets. Um, so that, uh, for a lot, for, for if I want to apply that same budget to larger devices, but I'm using the picture element, so I'm actually uh, choosing, choosing to load different, different image assets on my larger devices, um, then, 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 I, then yeah, I'll, I'll use my budget with the larger images. But the budget only covers the data required until we reach the event the budget is based upon. This means you can st still lazy load more Im content, images, crazy interactions later in ne if necessary. But we've got that perceived performance down as fast as possible. Um, the, the, the budget in this method is produced is a bit rough. It, it doesn't count for poor network connections beyond being slow. So it's like TTP slow star, um, uh, poor, yeah, poor uh, drop, drop packets, etc. won't be taken into account. It does, however, provide you with a set of guides you can use, which is really important when trying to discuss performance with the rest of your team. Because they, 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 to them, a lot of these are technical issues they don't really understand. So uh, then you might want to experiment with different performance budgets. So building a performance budget is about reaching the correct balance. It therefore makes a lot of sense to, to experiment with different figures where possible. And creating performance budgets should be a collaboration between your various stakeholders. So one such tool. Uh, that helps you to do this is performance budget IO. So let's look at performance budget IO. And hopefully the internet will work. There we go. Um, what's on that? Cool. So um, thanks for the screen there, so I'll go back to the key look behind me. So I want my site to look. So this, this, this is uh, focused on metrics-based um, performance budgets. So um, the, I, I specifically, actually looking how many of the, as the metrics of your assets. So what I will say is I want to load my site in. So I might say three seconds. Uh, then I can select a, a, um, a, a connection speed. Let's say 2G. Let's be really optimistic about our data. Then if you calculate, and then that will, that what that will, what will do is it um, will 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 say the performance budget is 56k. That's insane. Um, but what but what these slides will do below show is um, if we applied um, the average percentage of each of those asset types to uh, so the average website is made up of different assets, right? So you. Um, and, and, and obviously, there's an average for each website, for H, the average amount of HTML that the average website will have, CSS, et cetera. So I've actually applied those, those um, percentages to your performance budget as your default. Um, so because your performance budget is only 56K, it's giving you only 1K for HTML. Great. 
But we can change that. So we can say, oh, I don't want any fonts. My site's so super lean. Um, and then I can increase my HTML a bit. Uh, let's, let's just have a text-only site. Yeah, you can more HTML. Great. And then we scroll down, hit Finish. So we've got, we've got our budget. And then it shows me a breakdown. But what it also shows me is estimated to load times for those different, those different, for different connection speeds as well. So while I still only connect one connection speed, it shows me different um, connection speeds too. Awesome. Let's, let's try another budget. That's more realistic. So my five seconds on a TSL connection. Cool. We have a faster connection. So yeah, we've got 937 kilobytes to play with. So again, we can um, play with these. Uh, if we if we, if we see if um, we go over our uh, total uh, our budget, it'll actually give me a warning. Um, it will let me progress because it's, it's your responsibility. Uh, but we can drop it down there. Cool. Uh, so yeah, if you use this tool, um, it's, it's, just, it's just hosted on GitHub, so anyone can make make uh, contributions. Um, I built it on a hack day, so it probably just have a couple of bugs, but it was a fun project. Cool. So we actually had some some backup pictures just in case that that failed, but it didn't fail. So we're we're going we're going we're doing well. So me measuring your performance budget. So for your for your performance budget to be a success, it needs to be measured. So again, we're going to go back to web page test, um, the tool we use for uh, for visual comparisons. But instead, now we're actually going to use it for testing our performance budget. Um, so if we if we um, if we put the URL of the uh, Beamly news site in there, then we uh, we set this, like the uh, connection speed um, and click start. Um, we'll then have to get taken to the low screen and stuff. But then we'll get a summary of our page, um, which unfortunately we're doing quite badly on my first byte time. Great. Um, but if we, if we actually look at some of these metrics, uh, we can zoom in on uh, to the start render and see that so if we start to render on, on this occurrence uh, on, on 2.892 seconds, uh, then it, then like uh, we had we fully loaded at 9.734 seconds. And by the time it's fully loaded, it's only downloaded to 675k. It's also got this useful little button here that like if you, it's got dollars and it tells you how much that would cost in in different countries, which is cool. So you, you can look at these metrics in web page test and compare them against what you set out to achieve um, for your, bu your budget. So when you so we, so far we talked about uh, creating a performance budget for a new sites, um, but but often in the real world we're actually working with existing sites that we want to make performance budgets for. So the problem with the existing sites is they like to have performance problems already. They might be slow and bloated. This makes adding a performance budget that defines what we actually wanted to achieve really difficult because you're likely already exceeding it. This will mean we shouldn't create a budget, we just have to be a bit more careful. We should therefore create a budget based on our existing site. To do this, we, 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 we use our existing site metrics. So to, we have to find out what the metrics are. The easiest way to do this go back to a page test. So I, um, what I've, I made for the example here, I actually use a website that I worked on about four years, I think it must be four years ago now, which is the Glo BT Global Services website. Uh, I think it's changed a bit since I worked on it, but um, it, I thought it was a good test. Um, I, because I would, was looking at, um, I wanted to look at mobile specifically, I've sold that, I've sold Chrome, but I've said that um, I'm going to the browse for iPhone 6. Uh, so then if we look um, at, at the, uh, the summary, um, it's got a start render of 3.543 seconds. Um, it's got the, um, and it's got like a, a fully loaded 19.748 by, and the com complete by, uh, by saying is about 1.5 um, meg. And you have more dollars because it's more expensive than loading Beamly. Um, and then, then also a, a, a content breakdown tab, which will show you the um, kind of assets that the website's using. So, um, so we can see 600, uh, six, 658k of uh, images, 652k of JavaScript, etc. So it's actually that's really useful to us because we can we, we're, we're able to see what we're currently achieving. We can then use web page tests uh, because because we're using the web page wealth of data that the web page tests have given us. We then put together a, a performance budget. So this is my base budget. I uh, converted. I put that into this table, um, and then having determined the budget for existing site, 
we now need to look where we want to make improvements. So firstly, we identify areas that we're concerned about. So I was concerned about the, the JavaScript and the images. I think that that's a, a, a ridiculous amount uh, for what they were, trying to, they were achieving. So um, to actually interrogate that in more detail, I actually opened the Chrome DevTools and actually look at the network, um, network tab to see, see what images there are. Because uh, the reason I do, did that rather than just looking at this data inside my test is I can actually just download that image myself quickly directly from the dev tools to, to perform uh, manipulations on it to, to see what happens. So I took the biggest image and recompressed it side by side. They look identical. But it went down from 133K to 19K. So I, so I immediately am able to see um, that the amount of data being taken by images at the moment could be reduced significantly just by recompressing images. So it's not something I have to do um, a lot. I mean, all I did was resave this. I resaved it using Photoshop, and then I used uh, Image Optim to compress further. Um, so with that information, I now have, now have, now, uh, now have, a, have a, 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 and I now know that I can reduce the images. So I've, what I've done is I dropped that down by 200K. Um, so that's obviously going to speed up our site a bit. Uh, with our jobs, it, it, it looks like it's, it's significantly more tricky to reduce the amount of data. And the reason for this is actually that base.js file, is, which is 415K, is actually YouTube, uh, as is the WW embed player. So it's a third party. I don't have control of that. Um, we could, however, set a goal of removing jQuery and jQuery mobile, though, because it's 2016, right? Um, so so I, I then adjusted my budget to, uh, to encounter that. So I, I assume that I couldn't reduce the, the um, YouTube, uh, but I can reduce the um, I mean, I could defer, make sure that, I'm, that, that uh, YouTube is delayed to lo loading last, um, and that would allow me to, to drop it further. But I'm assuming they're already doing that. But, yeah. So maintaining a performance budget. So it's important that you don't forget about your performance budget. You spend a lot of time creating it because you cared enough about performance in the first place. Um, you therefore need to ensure that it forms part of your process. The way in which you do this, well, probably the, the first way you do this, do this is you do document your performance budget. I, I, and, and this is how you can enable so you maintain it. So I, so I came up with this, this uh, concept at work, um, where we keep our performance budgets in a perf.md file. This is kept in the same repository as our code. Um, an example of one looks like a bit like this. So again, yes, a, a page expe is expected to load in five seconds on a slow 3G connection. So it's written in just, in, in just, in just normal English, so it's something anyone can understand. Then we had then, because I'm using, I'm actually converted, I've converted that into a, some metrics I want to measure. I've set a budget. Um, yeah, it's just written in Markdown because obviously it then shows them like a thing in GitHub. And then I've actually listed the contributors, the people who have contributed to this budget, because then, say, in the future someone's got a question about it, they can just go and ask them. Again, Beam is very open, it's very, it's very open business, so we're very, we encourage people to talk to one another. On Slack, of course. Uh, <laughs> so by storing the file in the repository, it's this, it's this version controlled. This enables us to see what changes we have made to our budget performance budgets over time. And commit messages let us see why the changes were made. We then ensure that it is available to all stakeholders. Um, they, they, uh, so all our designers have access to Git. Um, and then obviously we'll do, we actually provide it to our, our um, product managers, clients, etc. We then use a style guide to communicate ch uh, side changes. So these changes might be anything from font sizes um, right up to creating new components. And, and obviously, it's those comp new components that can have a big impact on our performance budget. So Nicole Sullivan uh, wrote a great post on how having a, a living style guide can help improve, improve performance. So she worked with a company called, I don't know, I have no idea how to pr pronounce this, Trulia? Yeah, Trulia. Yay, uh, in 2013, uh, to improve performance. And one of the changes she made was to implement a living style guide. And when she was doing this, she reduced the HTML payload by 48%. She reduced load time by 21%. Achieved a 6% improvement in the first byte. Reduced unused un CSS. She also noticed in a blog post that it also led to the design being used across the site being more consistent. So outside of performance, the gains too. And the reason that she's able to actually get all these gains about, because of having a style guide, is it meant that, that everyone could see the wealth of components they already had. So rather than reinventing the wheel every single time and bloating the project, they would, they would, they would just literally go back and reuse, improve, maybe if you use BEM, write a modifier. Um, so, so we're building on top of stuff rather than um, 
rather, rather than starting again from scratch every time. Um, and then with this documentation, so you've got, you've got your documentation, you've written made a style guide, it's great. And this actually is, is even better because you can ensure you, you, that, that you're educating new, anyone who joins your project. Um, and and, and as, they, as people join your project, you can point them to your performance budgets that far, you can point them to your style guide and then talk them through it. So um, a, a performance, performance budget um, is, 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 really, is really important that you monitor it because it's very easy to blow your budget. Um, it's just like when you go, to, to go out for lunch at work, I'm going to spend a tenner, right? No, it's 15 pounds. Um, you, and then you, you might, so you might implement a new component on your site, or you might have a slightly different content in live than you have on stage. Um, so you, and these are things that could, they could potentially blow your budget. To help prevent this, there are a number of tools you can monitor you to monitor your budget. So earlier you mentioned web page test. Um, it has a, a, this fantastic API, which if you want to see a talk about it, Andy did what, the lovely talk about um, web page test uh, at this meetup. And, aside, and then aside from, uh, from using it to run our tests, we can use it as part of our continuous integration. Um, and we can actually re reject builds that fail our performance tests. So um, again, an example from Beanly is we actually um, we host a lot of websites for clients, and um, we actually have set, set up um, our continuous integration. So, well, because we use continuous deployment, that's the sort of thing. So we set up a continuous deployment. So whenever they um, they break the, their um, performance uh, guidelines, uh, it sends a test to a page test, fails, and then uh, uh, it'll fail because they've broken it, and it reject their build. And they have to fix that before they can go live. So if you want to regularly run tests, you can, you can use service like Speed Curve. So uh, we, we, we use this at, um, at Beanly to regularly, regularly run tests. So um, across the board, we run all the sites we host for clients. Um, I'll actually test at 12 o'clock every day. Um, and then we have sites that are actually testing more frequently. Um, so uh, the, I mean, we actually run tests using Speed Curve across all our uh, star guides so that um, we know immediately if, if the CSS is, is, is going to have a, an issue. So let's have a demo of Speed Curve. I think I can see it. So um, I, I created an account, and this is the first page you get to create an account. So we can uh, specify a website name, financial times. Uh, then we specify the website URL, which I put here earlier. Uh, then we uh, look at, so, th so then, then they ask you to actually specify the category that your site belongs to. This enables you to benchmark against other websites in that category. Uh, it does have an option of category not specified, uh, but let's see if we find what's the most relevant to um, maybe financial. No, it's more news, isn't it? News, yeah. yeah. Uh, then we can select a region we want to test in. So I want to test this from Ireland. Let's test from Ireland. Uh, and next step. Now apparently we, we have to go and get coffee. Great. Uh, so if we wait a couple of minutes. Yeah, no tests available yet. Cool. So we'll leave that. What we're going to do is we're going to leave that running. And talk about speed curve a bit more. So uh, we, we've, we've added our site. Um, then you can do some stuff like uh, you can configure checks. So you can check. You can actually set how often that each URL should be should be uh, loaded. Um, so that means that they can give you an average of those, those three. Um, you can also set up um, what kind of budgets you have. So you might have a start render time uh, budget. So you're. So you want to start rendering a certain amount of time. You can add anything to metri any, like metrics, like CSS uh, size, HTML size, etc. Um, and then once you set up your budgets, you can then set up some notifications. So if you use Slack, um, you can actually do integration with Slack. So it notifies you um, when you exceed your budget. Um, we'll see, see how, 
how terribly I exceeded my budget the other day in a second. Um, and then, if, then, then if, if you've actually had it set up on a site for a while, obviously the one we've just done for the financial times won't do this, but you can actually see in a, like, an, a, like an, a, a, a graph showing over time how your start render speed index and visual complete has been affected. Cool. And then we've got a lovely Slack integration. So I made my, my CSS fail on purpose because it, it's not failing yet. Uh, but basically, I set, set a rule that said that if, if my CSS is over 1K that we should fail, I failed immediately. Let's see if that's, that test has finished running. This is why I had this is why the slides talk about it, just in case. To do this way, at least tells me it's running. So I knew my demo, all my demos would be perfect. So, in summary, performance sites provide a better user experience, and they are a competitive advantage. So you should be stressing that to, to your clients. We should, we, we should therefore be ensuring that performance is the goal of our project, encouraging awareness across all our stakeholders of our project. To make this possible, we should use a common language that all stakeholders understand. So today, the language we talked about was performance budgets. Ensuring that during our regular testing of our sites, we are also testing the performance. Introducing monitoring when necessary to ensure that we are able to maintain performance. Uh, so a special thanks goes to my wife, Charlie Fielding, who has probably watched this talk a hundred times. Um, Andrew Davies at work, because he did some of the design slides. You can probably tell which ones he did. Um, and Phil Nash looking through, through and, and um, my colleague, Kate Mundori, for proofreading. I'll say, I'll say that's fun, yeah. Nope. Never mind. We tried to have a demo. Cool. So thank you. And any questions? Except why my demo's not working because I have no idea. Is it on? Yes, it is. Right, who was question number one? How do you regard the importance of monetizing a specific site performance? So, can you, can you sort of clarify a bit? Yeah, associating, explicitly associating performance with business outcomes like revenue or conversion rate or whatever. So, th th I always try and focus things from a user point of view of what the user is trying to achieve. Um, but you, you, you could argue, so you could, you could translate that into, into a user point of view as being um, that, that, you, that, you want, that you want to get a certain number of users to be able to purchase, make a purchase. Um, and that's, that's, a, that's a monetary cost. But then uh, it's very difficult because you, you obviously want to, to, to measure performance. Um, so you want, you want to create a performance budget that's, um, that works for users. Um, you want the things to load fast so that. Um, so, so that we get those comp that competitive advantage, um, but it's very difficult to create a, a performance budget that um, is directly related to um, it, to the, 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 the monetary money you're going to get in, uh, because um, it does it, it's there's not there well, was a correlation between having a performance site and um, Yeah, having a porn site and and having um, and, and and like having more sales, uh, it, it makes it's very difficult to budget. I mean, you could perhaps think about it in um, you, you could you could perhaps think about it in the ways of like I I want to increase my sales by one percent, so I'll so what what performance increase do I need to get to that? Um, I think, but yeah, I, I don't think you create performance budget specifically. Sorry. No, I was just I was proposing it as a principle, as a useful principle, because it, that is what ultimately engages the customer. They, what they want to understand is the link in which you mentioned between performance, performance, people making the site transactions, and business outcomes. That's the 
that's what gets attention. I think I can kind of add something just to repeat if that didn't come across from from Larry was like kind of getting this correlation between performance and actual business metrics. Um, it is really difficult to achieve this, certainly out of uh, synthetic stats, because you're not actually um, measuring at that point what the actual user interaction is because it's so so where I kind of like uh, go on this thing is this is much more of a facet of rum and actually monitoring um, like real user activity because and then correlating it to the statistic that matters for you whatever your site is it may be more important to you that you'd actually serve a lot of ads right because you're making ad revenue out of those things and actually getting the page views to actually see those ads you may be selling widgets on your site and and you know so therefore you're actually trying to sell more of those widgets it's like you know so it's it is actually a very different a very difficult thing to achieve that that correlation but through through rum the more typical things that you may be able to see let's say let's like kind of take the financial bit to one side one moment but you can definitely do things like what is the impact performance on bounce rate of your users? Yeah, what is the what is the relationship between performance and the number of page views that a visitor actually takes? So, what is the session? What is the average session length? Because there is almost certainly a correlation between if you can actually keep a user on your site for longer, yeah, they're more likely to convert. There are tools in the marketplace that will draw. A, like a correlation between um, these these real user measurements and conversion metrics but you have to put the effort in to kind of like configure those be the beacons that you're actually that you're putting onto your site you know you have you have to tell the tools when a conversion occurs and the word conversion being what you're trying to track. So I don't know whether that Larry is where you are trying to lead the conversation, but but it but it you know it it does it does depend, but very much so that in terms of getting business engagement, of actually showing those kind of things, yeah, is supplementary to what you can do yeah. with synthetic stats like Jonathan's been talking about. So, and um, so to add to that. Um, so that so if you don't add so so you don't have like performance budget, but you might run, you want to run your own study. So you could say um, run your own study where you artificially slow down your site by site by 100 milliseconds and see if that does have an imp impact. And then you can show them that that study themselves so in their with their clients. So you could do what Amazon have done and Google have done for yourself. Yeah. I know what you can do. Yeah. I know how to do it. I was, yeah. I was trying to prompt you to tell me how to talk to you. Yeah. Right. Next. How do you set a performance budget? How do you set something which is just good enough, uh, like reasonable, when you start a project and you don't have the analysis that you can make on your users once, right? Sorry, I didn't quite catch that. It's where do you set your baseline, baseline for good enough? So, um, so, so I typically um, look, 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 at my, look at my competitors. So that is good. If, if, so, like as Tim Cadillac said, being you should to be to perceive faster than your competitors, you should be twenty percent faster. So, I would look at your competitors and use that as your baseline of what's good enough. Twenty percent faster than your competitor is good enough. Um, but as I said, I, I tend to I want to be more than that. I would I would say that there's again a lot of indus industry studies out there that are kind of like say that user engagement is kind of optimal um, t between like one and four seconds that when it drop when it drops off after four seconds you actually start to have a really bad effect on on user engagement um, now you're not necessarily going to sit, achieve four seconds for every user in every situation and this is where you, you know you kind of have to do the you know the you want not, whatever percentage you want to set, was it 75% of users? So the 70th percentile, 80th percentile, whatever. So again, by understanding what your real users are, uh, are performing. Now, again, if you haven't got like a 
say, a more commercial off-the-shelf off the run, pr run product, you can get some level of understanding out of Google Analytics, the, the page speed um, statistics that are kind of logged in there, that you know at least maybe what the distribution is, um, but you won't, get the, you won't get the correlation from those. You need to go a little bit deeper than that. Any more? Sorry, I just thought I'd make you walk to the back of the room for no reason. But awesome. <laughs> um, so uh, no, so I do have a question. Well, it's more of an observation than a question. So um, <laughs> it's always the BBC. Sorry. Uh, so we uh, we actually have a speaker set up, uh, and we are doing various tests and competitors, and we have budgets as well, which is fantastic. It's great. Uh, but one thing, um, it, as I say, it's kind of more of an observation is. When uh, we are firing alerts to say somebody is over budget, uh, it kind of you, you get a bit of fatigue after a while. If I'm honest with you, um, and I don't know whether anyone else in the room has experienced some of that or how you deal with that. Um, if you're constantly kind of breaking your budget and then going back under and then breaking your budget and going back under, it, it you know you can kind of lose the the power of of what Speedcode can do, which is is to tell you you know those important things. Uh, have you got any thoughts on that and how you deal with that? Um, so um, the quick question I'll do is about the fatigue. Um, so I, my, my, my team is, is currently developing like our own internal CSS framework. Um, so it's completely being built with performance in mind. So if so, 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 so our performance budget is set accordingly, and it's setting speed curve against our, our style guide. So um, if say someone made a pull request. Uh, that said, uh, that that would push us over our budget, uh, obviously, and then and then we it's a, and and we've merged in, and it's obviously gone up and it's built, and speakers found this issue. Um, we're actually really concerned as a team how that happens. So you can so rather than like keep going over under over under over, what you should be doing is identifying why you went over in the first place. So I would look at um, like did, was the, was a design decision made that. Meant that you would go over because of you including big imagery, maybe, or you've, you, you, uh, what, are you are you not you, your components so dissimilar from each other that you can't share code? Um, and then, if if I'm constantly going over for that reason, I would then look at is the budget correct in the first place, and then ad adapt my budget to be correct for 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 the my project. Uh, so you, your budget is a, is a living, breathing thing. It's a, it's a tangible thing of talking about. It's also a thing that can change. It's, it's not fixed. Like I said, you can, you, can, you, can, you can do another commit and change a file that tells you what, what your budget is. Have you ever talked to emergency uh, coordinate budgets to stop everything? We do on live deploys of some of our clients' websites. So a lot, a lot of websites are built by external agencies. Um, that we host, and then they, so they'll, they'll go live, um, and we'll just basically reject the build. They, they can't get past the, the build. Um, and that, that, that's the same case for anything we build in, internally as well. If, if, we, if, we're going, if we're going to make a site that's too slow, it's not going to get released. I mean, that's a very strong tactic, you know, but um, if you actually create, have performance budgets that break your builds, and you have a, you know, you have that culture of performance where you you know, you do not let it go out if it breaks. That is one way to kind of control that flip-flopping. Um, you know, it is, it's a really difficult, difficult challenge, you know. So, yes, because I, I share your pain. <laughs> yeah. so, so I don't know if you know the history of Beamly. So Beamly used to be, uh, it pivoted a lot of times. It started as Zbox, which was a, a second screen app for TV. It then pivoted to being a social network uh, for TV called Beamly. Um, and the social network was just layer of layer of layer of code on top of each other. So it's huge performance problems. So um, when we did pivot again to be more of a news site slash marketing agency, that's when we literally, from ground up, started putting in, we have to be performance driven. We have to focus on performance. So we, we took an we took opportunity of a new build to be able to like, we have to drill, drill, drill in performance from the beginning. Um, if you can't do that, um, you can obviously go back and try and retrospectively apply these things, but that's a lot harder. And you will have that issue of the flip-flopping because you'll be like, you, you, you still try to adjust your budget to be the right level. Hi, 
Hi, you mentioned the importance of the user goals, like for example, Facebook writing a post or on The Guardian, like reading an article. How do you consider that into your performance budget and how would you document that? How, how would you document it in like, relation to the calculations? So um, Beamly, um, again, sorry, I'm giving you the Beamly's example because obviously it's what I know I know best. There are, 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 are um, sales as a lot of articles. So we want to get the article out in front of that user as soon as possible. We know from that the faster we load that, you, that, that article for a user, the more you users will actually start reading it and get to the bottom of the page. Um, Facebook obviously then do, have done the same sort of studies. That they, they care about user content because they make money out of you posting something on Facebook. Unfortunately, um, so they they obviously then have done a study and realised we need to get that that box there as soon as possible. Uh, same with Twitter, they've they obviously done similar studies. Uh, obviously, I think some of them they may be copying each other a bit because the fact that Twitter, uh, Facebook used to be the post box used to be a lot earlier in the um, load flow. When I made that video, I was like, "Wow, well, we've changed that recently," because uh, they used to have the top bar was actually delayed further than the post box. Um, but yeah, to, to make that to make those calls. It's difficult because obviously, obviously, you you want to um, you you want to choose the thing that's right for your user, but then you also want to choose the thing that's right for your user's needs. And then when you, when you want to make a performance budget around it, you can say something like, "I want to have my post box visible within um, five seconds on a slow 3G connection." So you you've identified a, a, me a metric you want to measure. You've identified the outcome um, that you want to achieve. Um, yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah. Cool. I think I'm going to add to it just slightly because if your question was about how how do you measure that point on the page, yeah, is like with the and certainly you can do it in speed curve, but you can do it in web page test as well. That in the I think get the right timing interface. I think it's the nav timing interface support user, yeah, yeah. user timing interface supports like custom markers, so you can actually fire a marker in the user timing interface that. That web page test will pick up, so you know as a developer the the assets that you're putting on the page to represent that text input box or whatever it is. Yeah, so you can put a mark right at the at the at the final time of that being delivered, and then see that as a as a marker, just like you get a marker for page load or start render. You you can you can see that point. And again, in speed curve like that, because you're doing it over time, you can see a chart as to whether that is moving or not. So that, that's kind of like a supplementary thing about how you can actually measure that going, going forward. Yeah, and we, we, we actually use Selenium for that as well. So you can use Selenium to do some, some sort of things. Yeah. So yeah, look up user timing interface and custom markers. There's a, there's a, um, Actually, on the Speed Curve site, without like signing up to it, there's a on the learning page. There is a reference to a talk that Steve Souders gave, all around like what is the right point to measure on your on your page, and it is it is about what's important to you. But there is no, you know, uh, page load has been used as like the kind of the global or on page load on load has been used as kind of like that global marker that we've all always used, but the uh, custom one will take you that next step further forward. But it is site dependent. It's, you know, it's for you. You have to set it. Yes, Ishi. Thanks for the talk. It's really useful. Um, back to a sort of general sort of bandwidth based budget. Um, how do you factor in variations from article to article where one user decided to stick in a bunch of animated gifs here and someone's got 12 embeds from facebook over there that kind of stuff because that's you know the real usage of your content system is going to vary so much from the deployed code so that's when you start getting into the implementation stage so you might um i mean it's hard to um to factor in the html size because that that can grow but sort of assets like imagery you can actually defer the loading and uh, so you can have, you can aim to get your your page visible to the user, in in a way that um, perceived perceptively is really fast. But actually, you've got a, place, a placeholder thing load on the page they can't see that an image is waiting to load. So when they, when you scroll down, you can then load those images in. So sort of lazy loading can be used in that case to uh, to take advantage to do to defer the loading of that image. Um, 
in case of GIFs, I always like to convert them to videos as well. So, <laughs> so I don't have to worry about that too much. Any more? Oh, one there, because I've got one. Right. I'll wait. Do the audience first. <laughs> Peter hasn't arrived yet. It's got plenty of time. Um, you mentioned about using a speed curve to measure the performance of your style guide. Yep. Um, so I'm wondering how that works from a kind of workflow point of view. I mean, do you push changes first to the style guide and then test the performance and then push to production, or how does it work exactly? So our, our, our style guide is actually split into two style guides. Um, we have base, which is um, topography, icons, forms, just base stuff. Then we have components, which are our components. Um, both of them are NPM modules. Um, that, that, that's, that's a built by a continuous integration system. So we, we use um, a Go by ThoughtWorks. So in, in, in Go, you have pipelines. So it, the first thing it does is it does a, 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 a release to um, NPM, um, and, then, and then it does a, um, so, does a, so you just release to NPM, and then it does a deploy, a deploy to S3. So that, that S3 is then fronted by Fastly, uh, to get actual rail and stuff. We have that, yes, we have Fastly in front of that. So that's how, how we actually we use for a real user, because they use, we use Fastly for our, our sites. Um, it's that we can then use to uh, perform our performance tests. So in, in, that, in, that, um, in that Go pipeline, we can run those tests and, and, and flag that that is a problem. Our, our star guide at the moment doesn't block do releases uh, if we, um, in, in that case. I mean, but we could in the future, when I get time, because I've got loads of things to do, um, look at um, gating it by saying, uh, um, to a temporary S3 bucket. I had that has, then obviously that has a URL, post that into a web page test, test the metrics, uh, pass or fail it. So you, you, I could gate it, like, I haven't yet. I've got one general question. On your performance budget, Dot io, yeah. and you talked about the you know the average ratio of components on a page. Yep. Um, where and what did you use to base those statistics on? I can't remember. I, 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 I was hoping you were going to say HTTP archive I think, query. But no, there, yeah. <laughs> I think it probably was. Like, yeah, yeah it's HTTP archive slash interesting. Right. Yeah, yeah I think so. it was that's interesting. But it's the thing. So I mean, is are those limits kind of configurable? Could you take that? You know, in in the in the source of the pro of the project and configure that yourselves if you wanted to do some do some work on it, or is that kind of really a bit hard set by you in the in the app? Uh, the app, so basically that that's a performance budget IO. It, it's, it's something hacked together while I was at a, a, a hack conference last year uh, over the air, yeah. um, and it was something based on the actually I was doing a talk on um, on response design at the time. I thought oh, it'd be great to do this tool. That can make my talk. Uh, but anyway, so th it, when I built that, I, I literally have an ar array that just has those figures. So, yeah. so that, that is very easy to adapt. Right, yeah. I think it'd be worth just having a look at that and putting in some more, like, just, let's say, some stats that uh, have, have, have got some measurement behind sure. them, yeah, and actually see what that would affect in your tool. Because it's an interesting concept what you've built. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and the, 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 one of the future improvements I was thinking of doing to performance budget AO yeah. was that performance budget perf.md file. I was thinking of generating that at the end right. because I'm trying to, um, I think that's a good idea. And the other thing that I kind of wanted to talk about or ask you about was um, it's this engagement over, um, it is like that perf.md file, kind of relating that to getting that into, uh, like, say, product product people's minds and actually getting them to think about performance when they're specifying the stories in their requirements. Um, you know, one of the one of the things that I liked in a in a recent talk that we had from Andrew Nielsen from MS, that they started off by just having their product team say, don't make it any worse. Right? Now actually when you think about it, that is setting a budget, right? Because if you say, don't make it any worse, well, you can measure what it is and what it is now and see whether it's changed. So that's kind of like the first iteration of actually getting product to adopt kind of like a very simple performance 
culture. And then you can kind of go from that to say, well, actually, rather than say, don't make it any worse, you can say what it currently is. Yeah, so you could actually get them to like kind of say, well, these are these are the figures for these things. And then because it starts the conversation about trading off between, say, images versus JavaScript, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, or feature one feature over another feature and things like this, rather than just getting progressively worse. I kind of I kind of like that. It, it works very well with when you're um, not developing something new, but you're dealing with a with a, a a huge legacy site, let's say, yeah, certainly this problem that I face, where the sites have been around for fifteen years, you know, and uh, and uh, and there's there's a lot of challenge there. All right, any more questions before we uh, get up, have a beer, and hopefully, Papa John's will ring me in less than ten minutes. <laughs> any more? Right, one last one. And then we'll have a break. Um, thanks very much for the talk. Very interesting. Uh, this, I guess, is perhaps a bit broader, but uh, you say you're a news site, content focused. So I just, sorry, I just wondered what your thoughts were on the uh, accelerated mobile page project, the AMP stuff, and <laughs> what, like, what is that, like, and how is that going to affect all of this? So, uh, I, uh, so I, I, I like progressive enhancement. I like being able to have in the HTML in the page, and then uh, I like to handle my stuff, but that my stuff stuff. I like to be able to take control of developing performance sites, and obviously they're trying to do it their way. Good on them, but I not really. I mean, I guess the concern is that they can game the system in the sense that they they author the search engine, right? Yeah. So they can wait wait it against. Are yes, it, it, it is a concern because yeah, they, you're right. They 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 control the keys, but then it's also not in their favour to to uh, lower something in the search engines because then they become a worse search engine and people, in theory, shouldn't use them as much. Not even use, people might start using Bing, but apparently Andy wants to talk about this. I'm going to talk about it. Not Pizza is here, right? Yeah. But, but, yeah. <laughs> so we're going to call it a day. But I'm sure if you want to hear what. Andy Davies' opinion of AMP pages is you can chat to him over a beer and pizza. Um, but there you go. But I'd just like to, before I go down and collect everything, just to say really big thank you to Jonathan for to put a lot of effort into this talk and um, really, really good and really interesting. And uh, I hope you've all gained something of it and go away and start thinking about budgets in your organization. Spread the word about the group. Come back. Uh, on this, I think it's 6th of September for um, Cornell's talk on really doing some really deep dive stuff with uh, image compression. So thank you all for coming. Enjoy the beers. Give us a good tweet, call out and stuff like that. And uh, we'll speak to you in a second. Thank you very much.